Thank you for that. That was great. Hey, you may be bucking for my job, Jonathan. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, uh, you taking the microphones back? Okay. Yeah. Oh, you will? Okay. We'll grab that. Our mission spotlight in the month of uh, November is wrapping up today. And our spotlight has been on uh, the Gideons. Uh, we've had some money come in from that. And if you'd like to give, what do the Gideons do? They distribute Bibles, uh, all different colored Bibles. They put them in motels. They put them in hospitals. They get them to nursing students. They get them to school students as well, uh, with, all the way from elementary up through college. Uh, so uh, keep the Gideons in your prayers, and if you'd like to give to that, today's the last day that you can do that. Just mark on an envelope. If you don't know where the envelopes are, there's some uh, by the back pew where the uh, offering box is, and also out in the lobby as well. Uh, are we on now? Yes. Part of the story that was not shared uh, is that uh, there was a family that had been displaced from their home nation. I'll let Jim, work out the sound here. And we're living in Iran. And uh, the father, who is around my age, was able to go out and work illegally because he was there illegally. And as well was his 25-year-old son. But when the father was found that he was there illegally, they deported him within the last couple of weeks back to the uh, land, the nation that they came from. And because of their ethnicity, they, uh, uh, the, the military there, as was said, is out to find those people and to kill them, execute them. They saw that happen while they lived there. That's why they ran to this other nation. And so that's just one family of probably hundreds of families that have been displaced and we see that continuing to go on uh, with what's going on in the Gaza Strip. Um, I don't know if you saw, but I, I try to keep grounded in that news of what's happening there. Just lines of semis with supplies to go and help the refugees in the Gaza Strip. That they were being held back by the Israeli military from being able to take that and, and to help the people who have been displaced there. Which millions of people have been displaced. And uh, that, that should affect us if we have the compassion of Christ. If it doesn't affect us, uh, then there's something lacking inside of us. We're not letting the Holy Spirit because it affects God and, and what he has. And so just be mindful of that while we have so much in abundance. You know, I won't ask who went out Black Friday shopping or who had more than one Thanksgiving feast over the weekend. Uh, but we have so much in abundance. And we need to pray for those who are less fortunate than us all around the world. We know that uh, this life is a temporary life. And uh, one day uh, we will be with Jesus. But uh, will we have blood on our hands or will we... Uh, be working and have maybe calluses and all because we have been on our knees and praying for those who don't have the resources that we have. Um, so let me enter into prayer at, in, in addition to what we've already prayed. Oh Lord, come. We'd ask you to come quickly, but we also don't want anyone to miss out on the reward that you have for us through salvation in Jesus' name. Thank you for Jesus' sacrifice, and thank you that we can come together and we can lift up uh, those who are persecuted, those who are going through difficult trials, those who are refugees, those who are displaced people groups, and ask for your help and your healing and your hope to pour out to them in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't know if you want to turn with me in your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 11. If I was there, I probably wouldn't turn to, in my Bible to it. And it's because it's a bunch of names of people that I can hardly pronounce and names of places that I can't pronounce that are, were meaningful to God and meaningful to his, his leaders that he had write down the scriptures. So Nehemiah in this case. 
But it's not going to be uh, a lot of great reading here. The, the first few verses are, are where we're going to plant and then we're going to harvest from the rest of the chapter. But I'm not going to go through and read all those to you. You're, wel you're welcome to. I, I believe there is a reason why God had Nehemiah write these down and put them in his word is uh, one of those reasons is God knows everybody by name. And even though he just lists the leaders here, he, 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 he wants to be intimately involved in every one of our lives and all that we do. And so it's important to God and thus it should be important to us. What am I going to do with this message today? I've thought about that. I've had a couple of weeks due to, you know, some guest speakers and all to think about this. But really the thing that I want to get, uh, what I titled this message is commitment to growth. And what I want to ask you, are you committed to your own spiritual growth? Now, part of that is you are here today. Maybe English is not your primary language, but you are here today. Maybe English is your primary language, and uh, you found out there's no food being served after the service today, but yet you still are here today. Uh, maybe all the rain and snow that came down and you thought, oh, it's cold this morning. I'm not going to get here. I'm not going to come, but yet you are back again today. And so that shows me that you are the ones who are committed to growth. And we're going to talk about how sometimes God puts us in hard places and yet still wants us to grow. Um, how does that work out? Sometimes, sometimes we are unemployed and we have to humble ourselves and go ask family or friends for some help. And that's a difficult position to be. Sometimes we find out that we uh, are uh, overskilled for a position and we can't get a job when there's a job open because they think once another position comes open that requires our skills, we'll leap right out of that and go to something else. Um, Sometimes we uh, are envious or uh, we're thinking about what other people have versus what we have, and yet God says, just keep your mind on your own business where you're at right now. Sometimes, you know, Apostle Paul was really good at that. Is he, he was happy with God when he had plenty and was happy with God when he didn't have anything at all. He just knew that God was going to be his number one resource and let God be your resource as well. So, you got it? You can go home. But if you'd like to hear the rest of the message, the rest of the story, I do have a few pages that are written down here. Um, it's not enough to just, with Nehemiah's campaign, to go and build the city walls. But we also know while he was building the city walls, he was wanting to build the people to help them to grow, have a sense of spiritual renewal in the midst. And I believe this is a great time for us to spiritually renew our hearts, recommit ourselves to God. And so I do have three key words for this message. It's recruit, reclaim, and regenerate. And so if you have a blank spot in your bulletin that you'd like to put that down, we're, we're going to talk about how you recruit, reclaim, and regenerate. Uh, there was a problem. Even though they'd rebuilt the walls, they had the temple, and they had the altar, and all the Levites were there, and, and the priests, they were able to do worship, but there weren't many people living in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, prior to the exile, had hundreds of thousands of people that lived there, probably close to 200,000 people that lived in Jerusalem in the time of King David and beyond, King Solomon, uh, even with the divided tribes, there was a couple hundred thousand people who lived in Jerusalem. Right now, it was hard to scratch up maybe 10,000 people that lived there. And so Nehemiah came up with a plan, and, and this is a continuation of uh, the organization and the administration that God gave in gifts 
to the body of Christ. At that time, it was Israel, the nation of Israel, trying to rebuild Israel after they'd been in captivity and been living as slaves for at least 70 years. More like by this time, it had been over 100 years, 140 years when Nehemiah got to Jerusalem. And so they came up with this plan of taking one in 10 people that are living in the villages or returning to the villages and bringing them to live in Jerusalem. And so w Jerusalem, though, at this time had been a ghost town for over 70 years. Um, even though some people had moved back, the walls remained in shambles until Nehemiah showed up with his building program. And they rebuilt the walls. How long did it take them to do that? 52 days. <laughs> They'd been in shambles for 100 years and people were just walking around the, the, all the, the rubble there. And in 52 days, pew, they got it built up. And they did this mighty plan. Sometimes you don't know how quick God can work until you put a little elbow grease into it. Get a little work done. You know, we can look up in the sanctuary hey, something is being done here to the physical environment. I hear there's workers that are coming back tomorrow to continue this project. Uh, that's part of it, uh, is, is getting things done. Uh, first, you know, the leaders of the people set the example by choosing to live in Jerusalem. Then they went out and they explained their plan that we want one out of every 10 people that live in our country, live in Judah, to enter into this lottery system, to be chosen by lot to come and live there. And so they followed through with that. And then secondly, once 10% of the population in Israel returned to Jerusalem, each one that came was recruited to populate the city. Uh, they were going to receive a blessing. Now, the idea of having to move to a city like Grand Junction or Denver, uh, Colorado Springs, with all their traffic, there's a reason why we live in a place like Delta, isn't there? It's to get away from some of those things. But sometimes God calls us to go into hard places, go into difficult assignments. And that's what was going on here. Uh, so they recruited the people. They populated the city. Uh, those people that came uh, had to deny themselves of some of their personal pleasures. You know, living in the country, being able to go out and and, and kill your supper right there. They had to go into these city walls and live in this place. Um, so one thing that we learn about them is they had a pioneering spirit. They were willing to endure discomfort, hardship for the greater work of God. And sometimes God calls us to do that, whether it be financially or whether it be geographically. He calls us to go to make disciples. And that doesn't mean just sitting where we're at. Uh, Zechariah the prophet was alive during these days. And he said in his letter uh, to the church uh, in Zechariah 4.10, For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice. I'm sure he wrote that after he saw what Nehemiah and the leaders there in Jerusalem were able to do in rebuilding the walls. Um, we find that Jerusalem already has some of the key elements in place. I said the leaders are already there, but also the temple has been rebuilt. The altar has been set up and they're doing their sacrifices. I got to tell you, a couple weeks ago, I got called out on my sermon. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, that person wasn't trying to pull one over on me, but said, you know, you were talking about all the different offerings that were going on and how they could go on and uh, burnt offerings and sacrificial offerings. We don't have to do those anymore. And you said we did. Go look at the tape. You can listen to it and see. I haven't been able to cross that part out yet. And I said, you know, you, you are right. And I need to go and cross that out because Jesus has become the sacrifice for us that fulfilled the law. 
And since it is fulfilled, now we live under the new law or the new law giver, Jesus Christ. And he is the sacrifice, so we don't have to enter into that. But there are certain kinds of sacrifices God may ask us to do. Move away from family, move away from home, uh, go and uh, 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 enter into a different culture to help people who, who need that help because they're living in your culture. And so you go and help them out as a modern day missionary. So there's lots of different things uh, that are going on. Uh, in the temple, they had the servants, the gatekeepers, the singers, and they were all from the tribe of Levi. But yet we also know that there were returning exiles that were coming from the uh, tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah and maybe some of the other tribes that were interdispersed as well. And so the community was being restored, including those insiders and those exiles that had come back to the southern kingdom from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Um, we know that this started kind of in five, let me see, the the uh, last of the King Nebuchadnezzar's taking exiles out of Jerusalem was like 586 B.C., before Christ. Uh, and Zerubbabel came back to reign as governor around 538, 535, and rebuilt the temple. Uh, it was, they didn't have a Home Depot around, so it was humbly built at that time. And then Ezra the priest shows up around 458 B.C., so 50 years after Zerubbabel, and he sets up the altar and starts the sacrificial system, and then Nehemiah comes to rebuild the walls in 445 B.C. So it's been some 140 years since the people, the masses, had exited. And remember, there were three different exportations that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had done, and so they just battled with the, uh, with the uh, tribe of uh, Judah and Benjamin, taking the people away, three different rhythms. Now they're coming back, and they're coming in as refugees. But there's challenges for those who are living in Jerusalem. A person had to reorder their view of material possessions. Because maybe if you went back to your village where you had a house or had some property or had a farm, you would be able to pick up from where you were at. But when you live in the city, you couldn't do that. Uh, you had to find a new occupation in the city, which more people were coming in, and so there were more needs, and so needed entrepreneurs to find new ways of making money, of helping their fellow man around, service kinds of work. Um, there was a giving up of that land to live in the city. There was a rearranging of social priorities, because if you were one in ten that was called from the villages to go to live in Jerusalem, <clears throat> it meant you had to move away from family, from friends, and from familiarity. And you had to move to a place that was unknown to you. Uh, you had to make new friends in the new place. Um, you also had to maintain an attitude of flexibility to deal with the problems of living in a city. Not a modern city with, you know, you think uh, modern sewer or, or electronics or even internet or anything. No, this, they were going back to a ghost town. No electricity. Uh, nothing like that. And you had to carve out your existence there. Oftentimes, though, those people from villages are very good at adapting to new environments because they've done without before. And so they can step into it at the ground level and work themselves up. As we've seen what's happened in our own community where refugees come here, uh, the ones that remain here have found how to not only survive in our environment, but to thrive here in this area. Uh, another thing was living in Jerusalem made you a target for enemies. Because the walls had been rebuilt, they didn't have to worry so much about thieves coming in and stealing in the night because they had a secure area. But they would have to worry about armies coming in, a massive military coming like they'd come from the Assyrians and from the Babylonians before. And so you put a target on your back when you moved to the big city and say, yeah, I'm a part of the establishment here. 
they were reminded of what had happened to their ancestors back years ago, and could there be future captivity by other nations coming in and stealing away? And then there was always the unknown, having to find resources to survive on in order that they might thrive in the future. The Bible tells us there's a city coming down from heaven to earth, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, when God is done with this earth as we know it, the city is called the New Jerusalem. And there may be some that are reluctant to go to the New Jerusalem, just as those living in the area were reluctant to go to the old Jerusalem because of what it stood for. Now, I wouldn't think in a crowd that comes to church uh, after a weekend of thanksgiving, there's very many that are reluctant to go to the new Jerusalem. But there's probably are some here that kind of like the life that you've carved out, kind of like what you have. You don't want to move to the new Jerusalem. You want to move to Florida. Or you want to move to uh, New York City or to California. Uh, you know, you want your own choice to be made up. But these people who had moved to Jerusalem, had to give up so much that was familiar to them to go be a part of something new. Just like you and I will have to give up that which is familiar for us to move to the new Jerusalem. Chapter 11 lists many men, tribal leaders, priests, soldiers, Levites, those who are servants, singers, and gatekeepers, that chose to settle in Jerusalem. Probably got the population, once they took that one in 10, got the population up to a working number of around 20,000 people. Still, only one-tenth of what had been there before the exile, but enough that they were able to continue working and doing things. Uh, that's probably the population of, of Montrose. But yet, think about Montrose population being in a city like the Grand Valley that had hundreds of thousands before. Uh, as we see what allowed them to go back, well, there was a change in the Babylonian Empire. There was new leadership that came into being. Artaxerxes, uh, who was the leader when uh, Nehemiah came, uh, had a different way of understanding how his kingdom was to be than Nebuchadnezzar did living a hundred years before him. And so he allowed the people to move freely within his kingdom. And so Nehemiah and the others were able to set up Jerusalem to be a city uh, once again. Uh, priests, you know, when they talk about the different ones that are here, yeah, I'll just go through this. They talk about the people who were there already, the leaders, and they talk about the priests and the Levites. Sometimes there's confusion about who are, the, what, who are the priests? Where do they come from? The 12 tribes of Israel? No, the priests come from the Levites. Every priest that handled the sacrificial duties at the temple was a Levite. But not every Levite became a priest. Some of the Levites weren't qualified to become priests. And so they would do other work as temple servants. It would be the, the work behind the scenes that was necessary to keep the temple going that nobody ever saw, but it was important. Just like sometimes we see in the church, we see those who are up front on the platform or the pastor who serves sort of like the priest. But it takes all of us in the New Testament times, not just Levites, but all of us as worshipers of God to keep everything going. So Levites also served as those servants. They served as singers. They served as gatekeepers. Uh, they were qualified by God to serve in the temple of God. All the priests were Levites, but not all the Levites were priests. Now, under the New Covenant... Since Jesus has come and fulfilled the old covenant, we are told by Peter in 1 Peter 2.9, you're a royal priesthood. All of us 
are considered royalty, God's kids. We're part of the royal family. And so we all are able to serve as priests today. I'm a priest over my family. And so I take that role seriously, uh, but I'm also raising up in my family other priests to continue in ministry. Uh, who is our high priest now? Jesus. Only Jesus. We don't need to elect a priest every four or six years, uh, become delegates to go to the convention and to figure out who the priest is. Jesus is the high priest over all of us. And he invites us into the priesthood as sons and daughters. He invites us to come. Remember in the prayer it said, men of God, stand up. Women of God, stand up. Children of God, stand up. That's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? And that's the way God has established for us. So uh, be mindful of that in your own homes, that you're raising up the next generation, or some of you are raising up the third and fourth generation in your own homes. You may have to add on to that home as they get bigger and bigger. But as we are raising up those generations, we are teaching them to become not only children of God, but priests of God, worshipers of God, singers for God, gatekeepers for God. What's a gatekeeper? Well, really, it's kind of like what we used to call an usher around the church. Sometimes it's a security team that they have. Is the ones that are looking out, making sure everything's working, everything's going. It's some of the people who show up early to make sure you have coffee for your cup. It's, it's the people who stay late because they're teaching in the classrooms. It's, it's those that show up when no one else is here and they're working to make sure this place is taken care of in every way. So we see that. But right now, the high priest is now Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit who he gives to us, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit is our master teacher. He's the one that guides and counsels us through life. We could call on him by name, invite him to take over and surrender our lives to him. So uh, as, as we close out this message, uh, we look at the ministry and you, you, I could read you all the names and the villages where people came from and the people who were there and the numbers of them. But the most important thing I believe that God gives us in Nehemiah chapter 11 is Nehemiah is continuing to lead, organize and administer the policies of God, not just of the king back in Babylon, but the policies of God with the people of God to grow the people to become a nation once again. And sometimes we have to start over in the church, growing the people to see that uh, together we are stronger than apart. Any of you ever played on any organized teams uh, like a football team or basketball team, uh, baseball team, uh, team sports? Uh, we have a coach and they're teaching you how to work as teams. Uh, they're wanting you to give all that you've got. Uh, make sure that you don't leave anything on the table, but you give it all and you do it for the team. And so we're like a team and the head coach is Jesus and he's watching over us, leading us, inviting us to join. And we're not here to just be fans sitting in the stands. We are here to participate as the body of Christ with team Jesus being the head. And he invites us to use the gifts, the talents and the abilities that he's given to us through his Holy Spirit. And every one of us has gifts. We've got things to offer. Are you allowing those gifts to sit there like what happened in Jerusalem during the time of the exile? It just sat there and things decayed and it rotted and it withered away. Are you using your gifts for the kingdom? Uh, those gifts, and you might say, well, pastor, I've used my gifts for 70 years. And, and my gifts are so worn out right now. No, your gifts aren't worn out. You're worn out. <laughs> but even the most worn saint 
still has great life to offer because of your experience. Your experience is needed by younger generations. And that experience can show up on a part of Team Jesus that working in an area specific to what you're compassionate about. It can help you be an advisor to those that are younger where you know you were a retired teacher, a Sunday school teacher, and you recognize those teaching gifts in a younger generation. And God may be using you as those elders, even though you don't carry that title, but you look it, uh, maybe using you to say, hey, have you ever thought about teaching in this area because I see in how you handle your own children, you'd make a fantastic teacher at Awana or, or, or helper with this certain ministry or to go out. And, and we need those older among us, those experienced among us, to continue to do that. Now, we don't know how old Nehemiah was when he got to Jerusalem. I happen to think he had a lot of experience being a cupbearer. Uh, for the king because he had started out and had moved up in the administration of this nation where he was a minority as a Jewish man. But by the time he got there, he didn't say, okay, I've reached the pinnacle. This is it. I've become what God wants me to be. But when he heard what was going on in Jerusalem, it tugged at his heart. When he heard what that place he'd never been to likely in his life, how broken down and scattered it was, God brought out of him his gifts to go and use for God's kingdom. God wants to use your gifts in his kingdom. And hey, you know, use them right here, right now, right in this place. Find out how you can share. And if you don't know what your gifts are, Oh, we can help you discover your gifts. Discover how God's wired you and how to plug in and do it. You probably are already using your gifts in your occupation. Uh, you're using your gifts at home, hopefully. And uh, now use them out abroad as we go on, whether it's in the work field or whether it's as volunteers to see what we have. Uh, ministry also involves serving in a role which God calls you to serve. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory, but if God's called you to a position, don't just accept the title, but work the position. Work it to the best. Glory to God. Ministry involves a willingness to serve without a claim. What's that mean? Well, it means that you're willing to do whatever it takes no matter who knows about it, and you're not beating your own drum. You know the people who beat their own drum, they've got to go and tell you everything that they've done. Even though it's really none of your business, it should be between them and the Lord. So be willing to serve the Lord without a claim. Be, ministry involves a willingness to serve without a claim, meaning Faithfulness, not fame, is the primary concern. God notices even if others don't. He knows what's going on. Ministry involves people first and programs second. Uh, the tasks and the people resource. Don't be so driven to become that task, get that task accomplished, get that task accomplished or to rebuild the walls, you forget about the people. And Nehemiah never did that. He continued to bring out the people that God was raising up to do the work which brings glory to God, not to Nehemiah. Brings glory to God, not to you, not to me, but to glory to God. And so uh, I, I love this. We're going to take a little break from Nehemiah, but we're going to come back and we're going to finish it out. I've already got the messages for uh, January, the first couple of Sundays, but we're going to dig into uh, just this whole thing called Christmas, uh, uh, kind of figure it out over the next month. Uh, we've got a couple of special speakers lined up that are going to step in and, and help 
me do this. We're also going to have a skit every week brought on to us by the mixed up Christmas pageant and those uh, kids that were up front here. So come back again and let's continue to plug into what God has for us. But in the meantime, uh, during the week time, if you want to uh, volunteer and help out with some projects around the church, there's plenty of them, like Vicki said, in the bulletin. There's a lot of stuff happening. And all that stuff is directed so we can be involved in the kingdom work for the king's glory and honor. And Vicki reminds me that there's still a few angel trees, angel uh, participants that have not gone home. I think I can see about five of them that are up here. And so we don't need one person to come and get all five, although that's happened before. But I think we could have five people here that could come and get each one of them. And uh, it has on the tag uh, a little code number that you sign your name and your phone number. And then also uh, it has what gift, where we contacted the families, what they said they'd like to have. And so if you'd like to participate in the Angel Tree, maybe you've never heard of it, Angel Tree is uh, comes from those who are incarcerated, either fathers or mothers or aunts or uncles. Uh, they can sign up and put their kids' names down and uh, have them get a gift at Christmas. And that gift doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from the church. It comes from that parent or, or, or that relative that's incarcerated this Christmas just to let them know that they're not forgotten. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and, and for your love. We thank you for the victory the football team had yesterday. I pray for those young men that were on that team that uh, Coach uh, Johnson and his assistant coaches were molded together as a team that finished the year undefeated here in 2023 and reached the top of the class of, of saying, we are the best, we are the champions Help those young men to realize uh, the lessons learned during this season and carry them through their lifetimes. And Lord, help us to realize the lessons learned in this season of our life and continue to have a commitment to grow and, and to become all that you desire each of us to be. And God, the things that are happening over the next month, may they help us be conformed to your image to be more like Jesus in every way. And may it show, uh, may it show when we uh, are living at home with our family and stress is up to here and we, may we be seen as becoming more Christ-like in our character through our conduct. For your glory and honor, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.